This is the Barn Find Pentium Pro. It's named such because, well, it has a Pentium Pro CPU and was found in a barn. It's a machine that I've owned for about 18 months now, and in that time I've taken it from a broken down, dirty, smelly hunk of junk to something that just about works. It runs MS-DOS and Windows 98, it plays games from the early to mid 90s with no issues, and it definitely looks a lot better. But it's not without its problems. You see, I've covered this in other videos, but currently this machine has a few... disabilities. The ISA slots don't work, neither do the built-in IDE channels, and the processor speed runs slower than it should. And yes, before anyone puts it in the comments, I have checked the bus speed and multiplier settings. At this point, I'm 99% sure that the motherboard needs a recap, but given that the Intel VS440FX has a mix of surface mount and polymer electrolytic capacitors, it's probably going to be cheaper for me to just find a new motherboard. Oh, look, a new motherboard. <laughs> So I actually picked this board up about nine months ago now on eBay. Um, it arrived at our home in Delhi about a week before the Packers came to box up all our possessions ready for us moved back to the UK, and I'm only just now getting around to looking at it. If you put it next to the existing motherboard, you'll see it's basically the same model, or at least uses the same reference design. I did a bit of research while looking for a replacement, and it looks like Intel either manufactured this board for other companies, or sold the design to them so they could make it for themselves. I'm aware that both Dell and Gateway had their own versions of this board, with only a few differences depending on which company's logo was on it. For instance, all of the boards have an ATX connector, but the Dell version also sometimes included an AT power connector for connecting to older power supplies. And Gateway apparently used these boards in their workstation lines and included an audio chipset and connectors on the board as well. I'm not sure who made this board, but it seems to be almost identical to the original one, so it should allow me to finally realise my goal of making this machine fully functional. The seller included in this deal this 200MHz CPU and 16MB of RAM. I'll leave the CPU in place as it's the same model as the machine currently, but I'll take the RAM out and replace it with four sticks from my spares bin. This gives me a total of 160 megabytes of RAM, which, in a machine from 1995, is immense. I did notice that on the new board, one of the clips for the included heatsink has snapped off, but luckily the cooler from my old board uses the outer lugs here, and not the two central ones. So with a bit of new thermal compound and a little bit of a wiggle, the new cooler goes on. And now it's time to get the board back inside the case. Now I have some decisions to make about expansion cards. I definitely want to keep the Adaptex SCSI controller in place, as the current hard disk and optical drives are all SCSI. I'll hopefully be able to use the built-in IDE controller on this board instead, but to be honest, the manual says it only supports older PIO transfer standards, so I'm probably better off sticking with SCSI. I also want to put back in the Trident VGA card. I did swap this out in a previous video for an S3 Trio 64, but I found that the system kept crashing within Windows 95, so I reverted to this card and it's working just fine. I'm also going to include this Allied Teleson network card that a friend of mine was kind enough to send over. It's new in box and designed for Windows 95, so hopefully will work well for allowing me to transfer files to and from my retro LAN. This particular model has both RJ45 and fibre optic network connections, but obviously I'm going to be using the good old copper connection. Now in terms of a sound card, I'm going to take out the Sound Blaster Live SB0100 PCI card. This card has served me really well in this machine and has excellent DOS support, 
but I should now have working ISA slots in this machine, so I'd like to use them. This Creative All64 is a better match for the age of this system and should fare a bit better in period correct games, so that's going in too. Now for those keeping count, I've now got three PCI cards and one ISA card in this system, which means I have up to three ISA slots and still one vacant PCI slot. I wonder what else I could shove in there. Oh yes, we're going voodoo in this bad boy. I recently polled the Retro Gaming Facebook group and asked which of the upcoming projects was worthy of this card. The majority voted for an upcoming Pentium 2 build, but it's my card, not theirs, so I'm going with the second most popular option and shoving it in this build instead. So with all that installed in the case and all the connections hooked back up, let's see what happens. OK, good start. So I just wanted to jump into the BIOS quickly and check that the CPU speed is now correct. Yes! 200 MHz, that's an excellent start. So for reference, the previous board was showing this as a 133 MHz CPU. It seems whatever problem it had, it was using the wrong multiplier settings. I definitely had the jumpers 100% set correctly, so I guess it's just one of the problems with that board, and now it's reported correctly, which is awesome. So now let's see if we can boot into Windows. This is the same install on the hard disk as before, so hopefully we'll boot just fine. It's looking good so far. Interesting. It's found the All64 card. So I guess that confirms that at least the ISA slots are working just fine. After I gave Windows 98 a few minutes to install drivers and chucked a few more on over my retro LAN, everything was working fine in Device Manager and the Glide API and Utility looked like they've installed just fine as well. Time to try out a spot of 3D gaming. Well, with the limited number of Voodoo compatible games that I currently own. So guys, what can I say? This thing is an absolute beast now that it's fully working and has that Voodoo card installed as well. This is now every bit the machine I had hoped for when I first stumbled upon this system in the summer of 2020. What's more, I'm finally in a place where I can stop messing around with this machine and just sit back and enjoy it. And I definitely plan on doing that with many more games supporting the Glide API just as soon as I can lay my hands on them. I hope you've enjoyed not only this video, but all the videos on this machine that have led to this point. It's been an adventure for me to bring this machine back from the blink of oblivion all the way to its fit and healthy state today. And the only question now is, what's next for this machine? If you've got any ideas, drop them in the comments below, and we'll go from there. With that said, thank you so much for watching, please like and subscribe if you're not already, and I'll see you again soon. Bye bye.